trafficking, that we are a source, a destination, and a transit country for trafficking in thousands. Girls, including young boys, I mean, they bring a lot of Almudus from other countries to Gambia, you know. So, but I try to look at specific cases, looking at some of these girls, and then going to the police. And the PRO at the time, David Kuyabi, admitted the challenges they had, because whenever they go after this um, traffic, um, this agency who are recruiting the girls, they get stumbling blocks. You can feel that there is some power up there that is also stopping the police from their work. So when I published this story, you know, the BBC, they also picked it up. At the time, the president was in Malabo, um, in an AU summit, and then they said the president got embarrassed by my story, and the major crimes unit also came after me. You know, so I got detained. This was my second time. I mean, it's still related to youth stuff, you know. And then these girls, I think my brother here, Flex, will remember, he was in the UK at the time when I lived in exile, because I got some girls that were good. And these are girls um, who were daughters of the uh, companies, clapping for Jame. So it was in, 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 um, in um, uh, I think in exchange for the support they're giving to the president, they are promised that they'll find jobs for their daughters abroad. So you let your daughter go, you just, all they needed to do was to find them passports, get them um, these vaccine cards, the yellow cards, and then you take it to these people. There was an agent that was just a traffic light. You know, they had this um, office, and then, so they will facilitate everything. And then you send a contract. But once you've gone there, what happens there, the family had no clue. You know, and the police were finding it impossible to investigate these crimes because these people were untouchables. So um, just to cut the long story short, a lot of things happened. And that's why I said at some point I saw myself in what happened. I was in Senegal too when Killer Ace came. We started doing a lot of stuff there to create a lot of noise and attention of the world to what's happening in Gambia. And when my brother also came, Mohamed Sanding. So we continued fighting until, I mean, the day that Jamel left. I remember when he left, we were at the border helping displaced Gambians that night. You know, we saw these displaced people, you know, because of joy, they were crying, they were laughing, they were dancing, and then like singing songs of freedom. It's like Gambia is free finally. The next morning, the caravan came and the buses, they all started going home. So we had to pack, instead of coming home as Gambians, we had to go out to Dakar and started thinking of how can we come back to our home. I mean, the rest is all history. So here we are. I'm so happy that somebody has taken this job and to dedicate themselves to this work and exposing or trying to find solutions to avoid the repetition of what happened. I'm so there are a lot of lessons we can learn here, but then there is still more that, 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 has, that has to be done. Um, I think this is a good initiative, so I'd like to thank you. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. and Mrs. Bauer. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am Idris Ajalo, a freelance journalist. Um, this is a wonderful additional findings. Uh, to me, Fantanka did a great job. Um, and I am concerned on the duration of the findings. What, what is the duration of the findings of the so, report? We, we said, uh, we, um, what we looked at was the 22 years, uh, viola 22 years of human rights violation. So the idea was to see how it impacted young people. So most of the young people are uh, people who were, let's say, from 35 down at the end of the regime. So people who have been very young during Jamis time, and so some of them nine years, 10 years, when he came into power, or even younger than that sometimes. Uh, and so that's the, that's the age range that we look at. But we also tried to interview some people who were um, a bit older, just a few, uh, I can't remember the numbers now, but a few uh, who were in their maybe 18, 19, during the uh, middle period of Jamais regime. So we can get an idea of people who have now grown you know, out of the youth bracket, but they have had experiences as a youth within that period. Um, but the majority of them are people who are still within the youth bracket or have just maybe uh, gone past it now. So um, that was the idea. So it was mostly people who by 2016 were 35, or uh, between 20 to 35 uh, in 2016. Do you start um, drafting these additional findings after which uh, the Minister of Justice uh, published the final report? Yes. No, 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 not uh, after. We started it while the TRS was in the was process good. of writing their report. Uh, we did the interviews. Uh, and then when the TRS report came, we also relied on some of the information, some of the evidences that were contained in the TRS report. Uh, as he mentioned, 
Uh, we did the interviews, uh, focus groups, some of the work that Fantanka did, and then we also rely on data from the CRRC. So we, it was kind of a parallel process, but their report uh, finished or came out before ours was done. Yes. Yes, Mr. Hart. I uh, thank you. I think that was a really um, fantastic um, uh, report, um, and I, it really captures um, almost everything. Well, can't capture everything, but captures so many important areas that affect the youth um, within the context of of the TRRC, within the context of of transitional justice. Um, so, so well done. Really. Uh, fantastic. So sometimes I was jotting and I'm thinking, you know, some of the things I wanted to say later, <laughs> uh, actually. So that, that you know, uh, reinforces the point of the quality of the of the report. I, I have to admit, I only came, I only came because Mariamo promised me food, okay. And um, and never mind the youths, right? I also own my civil and, and, and socio-economic rights. I have, a, you know, I'm entitled to food. So I'm here I am, and I have, I have, I have an appointment, and I'm thinking, what do I do? Uh, do I go? Because I don't want to miss the food as well. So, so I text, uh, and you know, so I'll have to leave shortly. Hence, um, I want to, uh, I want to. So, I am going to speak um, in my capacity as um, as as um, a lawyer who is interested um, in in this sort of work. Um, on one hand, but the, on the other hand, as well as somebody who was um, involved in in the in the in the TRRC final report, um, Imran actually wrote some. Some, some there are chapters in the report that were actually written by Imran um, as well. So, so just to give you an idea as his understanding of, of these issues. Um, some of these areas uh, in terms of um, socio-economic right violations, um, um, property rights and stuff like that, and some of the, for example, um, the violations on the on the on the on the beach boys and how that affected their social economic right um, rights um, as well as the the black market and stuff like that. All these violations and abuses that are linked um, to their livelihoods, to their social economic rights. Um, unfortunately, um, I you know I last week I spoke to um, a, a former minister within the PP, PPP regime uh, in relation to the seizure of his property. Um, and he lamented the same thing that perhaps the TRRC should have looked at this uh, in terms of people who victimizations were not civil and political but socio-economic. Um, TRRC was handicapped because um, the TRRC Act was passed by Parliament was only concerned with well strictly was only concerned with um, civil and political rights violations. But that is not uncommon. So if you look at um, all the truth commissions, almost exclusively, with the exception of few. Because that is the narrative. So, so we focus on violations um, arising from murder, rape, uh, and that, that kind of thing as well. Uh, but, but this is an issue that we have to interrogate, that we have to, we have to look at more deeply uh, going forward, um, because it is, it is a handicap. Um, incidentally, when I, did my, uh, when I did my LLM, when I did my master's, I actually looked at uh, transitional justice, and I looked at truth commissions, uh, particularly in terms of Kenya, uh, and I looked at land rights and how land is is taken away from communities and stuff like that uh, but the commission they had so so the idea of that was to was to challenge this you know or inter interrogate this issue why when when we're going through political transitions uh, like the one we had here after conflict or, or civil war or something of that sort we we tend to focus exclusively on violations of civil and political rights and not on the overrides. And in poor countries like, like Gambia, actually, there's this argument that, that probably violations of socioeconomic rights are actually more, more relevant and more meaningful in the lives of, um, of, of individuals whose rights are, are, are violated. So, um, but, but there's also a, a, a reason for that because we've got the ICCPR, which is the International Civil and Political um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, first, only included those rights, so the economic rights, hence they are called second generation rights, because they came much, much later. I think the other one was in 1940s, so the other one came in the 1960s or 70s, hence they, they almost treated as second class rights. You know? so, so hence the reason why when, when truth commissions or when, when, uh, when these issues are looked at, there's a hierarchy. So it looks like the um, preference is given to, to 
typical rights violations rather than rather than the others. Um, so that is an issue that 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 must be that must be looked at. So when the TRRC Act was passed, again, um, the legal team, the commissioners can only limit themselves to 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 what is in the act, and what is in the act is not these things. But but this is an issue that affects not only the youth, affects a lot of people as well. Because if you go to Funi, for example, when the TRRC, when we went there in at the end of May with some journalists to look at some of these places where IADMA was dumping people. There were parts of it that were as far from, for example, from here to Bigelo, um, buses that, that were acquired by IADMA. But these are farmlands owned by, or, or lands owned by uh, people from Pony communities that were seized from them. And in other places, fertile land was seized from, from individuals uh, affecting youth as well, because they relied on this land for subsistence farming. Um, so. Um, so that has direct impact on their livelihoods, on their socio-economic rights. These issues haven't been looked at. So all the people whose land and property have been seized, the TRRC look at, but those are serious violations as well, but of a different nature. So, so there's this gap. Um, there's this gap, but this gap is not limited to Gambia. This gap is within the, the whole transitional justice uh, narrative. But, but, but closer to home, um, I want to um, focus on... on, on on, on, on certain areas. Madam, I was going to show you this again to reinforce my handwriting. Uh, you can... <laughs> um, so TRRC looked at so many areas and topics, but, but I'm just going to bring some examples. Like Imran said, religion, uh, which is actually something that Imran worked on. Um, so religion, for example, how the, how the Ajami used um, the Supreme Islamic Council to entrench himself uh, and stuff like that. So we looked at SGBV. We looked at PATP, the, the alternative treatment program, when um, um, people with HIV uh, concoctions and stuff like that. We looked at uh, witch hunting and attack on, on road users. So the TRRC looked at all of these issues. However, the TRRC didn't look at the youth as a constituency of its own, as a distinct demography within the Gambian population and how it was marginalized and brutalized and abused under the Yajami regime. So within this uh, demography, then you have women and girls who's, who were sexually uh, abused and, 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 and violated. But, 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 within the, but, but this has to be looked at within the, 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 the parameter of, of, the, of, the, of their youth. So to be able to engage with the issue within the context of you. So the TRRC uh, didn't do that as well, but perhaps the TRRC didn't do that because, because some of the issues that were linked to um, socioeconomic violations and the TRRC believed that it lacked um, uh, mandate to, to, to look at that. Um, however, um, going forward, uh, there, are, there are areas that can respond to some of these issues. Firstly, uh, in terms of socio-economic right violations, these are included in the draft constitution. So in a long way, this can address some of the issues and some of the challenges that our youth are facing. So going forward, as part of your advocacy work, we can put more and more pressure so that, so that um, the, the, the draft condition comes to light uh, because it emphasizes not only on this, but emphasizes on, on, on um, socioeconomic rights. And you can even take these techniques to court. And the National Human Rights Commission, for example, can even deal with some of these issues. But after it's coming into force. So, so it is important that, that going forward, we start targeting some of these things because it will have some impact um, on, on, on the youth. Um, some of the other things um, as well. Um, when we talk about policing and the criminal justice, it is important that we also ask this question, what is the relation, and Imran was saying this thing as well, uh, what is the relationship between the state, between the state and the youth? The relation between the state and the youth within the context of our criminal justice system. Because I'm so, uh, this is not scientific, but statistically, I'm guessing most of the people who are caught within the circle of criminal justice fall within the, the youth bracket. And they are marginalized simply because they're youth. And even if you look at some of the things that has happened, not only the but within this administration as well, the Farabar incident. Most of the people who were casual, these people who were uh, whatever, fall within the youth bracket. When you look at what happened in Sifo 
Sanyang Usi for last year. St again, what did it, what was it in relation to land? Okay, so, so hundreds of you were arrested and some are taken to court and prosecuted. But it was in relation to, so they, they, they reacted because they believed it wasn't a violation of their, of their civil and political rights, but what they believed to be a violation of their rights in relation to land ownership. Okay, this land that they need for, for economic purposes, and therefore they weren't going to sit and allow deprivation of those, of those rights. So, so just show you the, the connection between socioeconomic rights, and it is more immediate and more relative to our circumstances on a, on a, on a daily basis. So, and to reinforce that point, if Yajeme were, for example, taken to The Hague today and prosecuted, we all want that, and millions and millions and millions of dollars is spent on that process, it's wonderful, it's great. Um, but what does that actually mean for that poor farmer in Sintet whose land was seized or whose family land was seized from the Jammeh administration? So it's justice, yes. You know, he's prosecuted and everything else. But, but that doesn't have any meaning. Um, what I mean, relative to that person's circumstance. But, but if there is a commission today that says all the people whose land and properties were seized unlawfully should be given. So if you tell that person now Jammeh is, is sentenced to death, yeah, they're happy, but it doesn't make any difference in their lives. But if you come to tell the person now that, that your land that was taken from you in 2003 is going to be given back to you, it makes a fundamental day. It's going to be one of the happiest days of their lives. So we have to now look at the intersection between, um, so, so the, the, the role of the, well, the, the link between the state uh, and the youth within the criminal justice system, but that is just to make sure that, that the laws and everything else, that when you go as a suspect to a police station, that your rights are respected, that you're not abused and violated. But, but that, that doesn't really give you food on the table. So that's just making sure that the government obliges by its rule to make sure that your rights are respected. But when we also have to look at <coughs> the role of the state as a provider in terms of equal opportunities uh, for youth and empowering youth in terms of opening the space uh, for, for socioeconomic rights, and here mainly it will be um, social and economic rights. Um, so so uh, uh, that is something that, that, that this can push and, and over studies that, uh, that Fantanka and others are, are engaged in. Because unfortunately, the structural inequalities that, that existed on the IJME are still here. They haven't gone away. So what may have gone away, may, it is still here, what may have gone away would be the systematic or the systemic violations abuses. That may have gone away. Uh, but not even entirely, because if we look at the anti-crime recently, if we look at the victims of anti-crime, regardless of what that, those thieves do, because we all hate them when they break into your house and, and seize your stuff, we know that, but that's, that, that's, that's, that's regardless of that. If you look at, if we do a study of the people, uh, a study of people who, um, since anti-crime came into being, were arrested and detained um, when, when people, because I was involved in one where, and they took a hoe and, and hit this guy and, and it landed on his private part and seriously affected. This was only in 20, uh, recently, I think 20, 2019, 2020. But if you look at, if you look at anti-crimes targeting, sometimes in the middle of the day when you see the trucks, you don't find elderly people at the back of those trucks. It's normally youth. It's normally people who are from 15 to 30, people in their 20s. Because by being between the youth population, uh, youth bracket alone, that in itself, without even doing anything, even walking the street, it's like you're already classified, okay? There's this profiling of you. So there has to be serious interrogation of how do we change that mindset? And, and how, by changing the mindset at the same time, we create opportunities uh, for you in terms of empowering them politically, empowering them economically, and empowering them, um, in empowering them socially. And, and like I said, we have to break the structural inequality because they're still here. If anything, they may even have worsened. So just because there is an absence of brutality, does it mean there is absence of that marginalization and structural impact that affect our lives? Okay, and socioeconomic challenges actually affect our lives more than anything. If you wake up in the morning and, and there's no money to buy breakfast and stuff like that, that has more meaning uh, to your life, it, like that has that's a small serious um, impact um, uh, your life as well. So, so going forward, um, I think um, we have to really begin to. So perhaps the government can, uh, the white paper will be coming out uh, maybe in two months. But what we can do 
is to put pressure on government. Something like maybe cabinet paper or, or, or something where there will be an inquiry, there will be an interrogation, but focusing exclusively on the youth. The relationship between the state and the youth within the context of, of criminal justice, within the context of economic empowerment, within the context of political empowerment and, and social, um, social mobility and stuff like that. So perhaps that can look at all the challenges, everything that the youth went through, the structural, political, all those things that affected you from 1994 to 1990, uh, 2016. But to date, because these things, like I said, um, the, the, some of the slaps, some of the more systematic may have gone, but, but structurally nothing has really changed. Okay, the bombs are telling you maybe there, there's a little bit more freedom now in terms of whatever, but, but, but those socioeconomic circumstances have not actually changed. And, and part of that, so the other issue as well, perhaps, that the TRRC couldn't have looked at, which is important, and you mentioned it, because the Bakwe syndrome um, was, was, was a byproduct of the Jami regime. It's, it's by product of the Jami regime, so so it has to be interrogated further uh, to see how those, you know, and, and some of the other things as well uh, that you discuss. So, uh, for example, Joy Sonko from from Bara, who testified, uh, she was arrested when she was in grade nine or something like that because her uncle was a candidate for one of the opposition parties. So, she was arrested. She was detained. Um, when she was released, she felt. She was scared to leave her house, to leave her home to go to school, and eventually she dropped out of school. So if you look at um, other individuals as well, I, I cannot remember this, this uh, boy's name as well, but um, Palmarima Johnson here, which is two minutes from here, was when somebody texted him and said something like, you meet somebody that went to, but I can't remember the facts now. But that's when he came with his dad, in the dead of night the jungle as we're waiting for them in black and black black. So he was taken away, I think it was like 2 a.m. or something like that. The dad was crying, it's like, you're taking my son away. Because, but clearly they went black black and the car was tinted and everything else. This is right, this, this, uh, they, you know, we dealt with this testimony, a, a witness statement. Um, so there are so many individuals as well. Uh, I don't want to get into, into individual stuff, but, but for example, even Sanasabali. Fracture in the relationship between him and his son as the result of his victimization. So a whole generation of our youth from 1994 have been affected at a family level. Economically as well, because they dropped out of school because their dads were killed, murdered, disappeared, or imprisoned. And therefore, the people who were there as role models, but also to provide for them uh, economically and also to be there socially, were gone. And some they became paralyzed and they dropped out of school and they felt like they've been pushed to the margins and they were no longer part of the conventional society. So and and this has effects on, on crime. And when people are angry, they they feel like, you know what, they say cannabis, whatever, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna roll my joint and smoke on the main highway and I'm gonna wait for a police officer to come on whatever because they are angry. They are angry because they believed the system is against them. And that hasn't actually changed. So we really have to look at all these issues about, uh, but first government to come to the table so that we, we have a more broader but more specific uh, conversation uh, about this issue. Because, because there, is a lot of, um, there is a lot of marginalization of, of, of the youth, but we should begin to, to look at what government response is going to be. But government cannot do everything. Civil society, so what you're doing is fantastic, but you can't do it alone. Uh, so that means there has to be a broader, more more unison concerted efforts and, and, and purposive response so that we, we, we are able to, to know what the problems are so that we can begin to articulate uh, the, 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 the challenges. Uh, we, there is so much, but I hope that just gives an idea as to the terms of the TRRC, uh, but within the whole framework um, of, of what we can do within, within the youth democracy, uh, uh, demography, uh, what, 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 uh, what can be done, um, if that makes any sense. That's my small, my small two cents. Thank you very much. That was a great insight into, you know, it's like you're just summarizing everything that uh, we wanted to bring out here.
um, it's a shame, or oh, should I say, I don't know what happened, but the National Youth Council was invited. And I, aha, uh -huh, okay. I thought you guys were not here. So I am hoping that these um, uh, things are taken um, into account. And uh, I know you're doing a great job, but, you know, please, so here are some of the things Party also said and Sana also said. What this report also did was to kind of look into retrospective kind of violations. You know, people now are over the age bracket, but they suffered the violations when they were, um, uh, you know, within that bracket. And uh, they are still suffering. Jackie here knows that people, a lot of them need mental health, psychosocial support. Until today, they don't talk about it. It has been going on for generations. You know, she's a psychologist. She can emphasize or, you know, um, elaborate on some of the reasons why we need, we seriously need to expand our mental health and psychosocial support. A lot of young people are traumatized. I want that message to go to the National Youth Council. Young people need to be supported. You know, they're having children. They are, you know, going through stuff and they've not even de dealt with the trauma they experienced in the past. And that can affect how you approach people. A lot of young people are angry. Still, the way they talk to you, while your mud getting wide, people don't even want to listen and talk to you properly. People are angry. We need to deal with them so they can try to approach things civilizedly. You know, we talk about discipline problem in the Gambia. We have a lot of things. But we don't, don't go back thinking how it started. How do we deal with this? Do you understand? We just keep an eye on them. Then you about it. They're not just here about it. Something is wrong somewhere. We need to sort out. Yeah. Thank you very much, Fatih. Thank I you. To, um, yes. I have to. Have Your food should be. With. <laughs> I suppose I wanted to just add that can we add psychological empowerment? Absolutely. Into yes. The process Absolutely. As well? Because I wanted to say thank you so much for your inclusion at looking at the intergenerational aspect, because it's a part that we often exclude, especially in terms of what it means for our interventions post a truth commission, where we have the exclusion of our youth that becomes our next generation of leadership that comes into power angry, that the wounds from the past are still unhealed and unresolved, and so they become our next generation of dictators, yes. oppressive ministers. That just creates a repetition of the, the same cycles over and over and over again. And so, so while there's the need for uh, you know, our reparations and processes for the, I want to say the older generation, our youth population and our youth group is where we change the future of the country. And when our interventions exclude that process, yeah, we have our that continue to continue. So thank you so much for including that in the... Yes, no problem. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much, Mariana. Um, I am Eric from the National Youth Council. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this must be okay. I must confess that um, you have done a very good job and well done to you and your team. Um, this is a personal testimony of young people who have gone under serious humiliation during the previous regime and even now. And we must uh, commend you for the for complementing the efforts of the National Youth Council. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to the age bracket that is that you just mentioned. Um, is 13 to 35, not 13 to 30. Yes, I, when I'm doing the work, when I'm doing youth work, I use 35. But Gambia statistics is difficult to get. I needed to quote that. All I had was the one that said 30, I'm um, up to 30. So, yes, we can um, look into it if you can let us or direct us to any site that will give us the accurate. For the Gambian context, we wanted not the international 35. Even the international 
uh, one because National Youth Council is it uh, Gambia is a treaty to the African Youth Charter, and you know what it means when you sign a treaty, you're part of it. So and the national the, the, the African Youth Charter was adopted and ratified in the Gambia in 2006. So it is at times called the Bandi Youth Charter. So we cannot afford to do away with that age bracket. So nationally, we use in 13 to 35. Perfect. This is part of the reason we're doing validation. So, yeah. Okay. So we keep to that. Like I said, even this um, uh, report looked into youth up to 35, but that statistics we needed to. Um, have something that was concrete. We don't want to say things out of our own. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, Mohammed. You can come. Uh, okay, I can come. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Ramin Your name is? Ramin BCC. Ramin BCC. Yes. Um, I think the report was fantastic. Thank you. You guys have done a wonderful job. And um, I'm focusing a little bit more on the, on the recommendations. Okay. Yes, um, actually, I think it's important maybe if we could, if we could have add mm -hmm. um, the political aspect. I'm looking at for the past 20 years how politics divided the Gambia, especially young people, and um, how it is also continuing to divide the young people systematically. I think mm -hmm. um, it's something that we could actually venture into okay. as well. Um, what I'm very particular about in your recommendation also is the fact that, that there is a room. <laughs> Um, between the security forces and young people. And I think um, that is very important, that is key. Mm -hmm. And um, that is the reason why, um, with support from the United Nations systems, we have the people, through the people in front, mm -hmm. you know, we have uh, a lot of initiatives, you know, like, you know, peace and security, and justice office and the council, and also um, the online security dashboard that looks at issues of security, especially around young people, so that we can also have you know, a report from the youth component as to some of the issues that young people have been affected. Hassan, So that it could also build a caucus uh, with the government. Also, what we are doing to address that uh, is to also look at our laws. That is, you know, the Youth Council Act. You know, so are you from the National Youth Council? Yes. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Right, thank so, you. so that you can also look at how this we can change the act mm -hmm. because it has been there and then we, you know, the realities now have changed. Mm -hmm. And then part of some of the recommendations that we're looking at is how do we ensure that we have also, you know, the, the Minister of Interior part of, you know, the, the sectors. I think that will also help in addressing um, the, the, the first recommendation. But politically, I think this is something that we definitely need to look at as a country because it is it is moving on and it is dividing, you know, the, the communities, especially our young people. And then we need to find a way in ensuring that we're able to invest more in, in, in that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think everything I've been saying, basically, especially by uh, Pat, he did say everything I wanted to say. So the only thing I think I want to add is even a reiteration to some of the points we were saying. I think one thing I'm very passionate about as a uh, victim is um, the offsprings of perpetrators. Because uh, I just said this instance with you, this. Uh, happened to me where I went to a gathering and I I bumped into the son of somebody that's in prison for my dad's murder. So, I mean, I was there with, I mean, I was very observant. Thank God that I had gone through most of my, you know, times and uh, I was able to view him in another light, which I would not have, you know, done if I hadn't recovered, you know, to a certain degree from some of my own you know, predicament. So, but what happened is I found out that, I mean, this young guy is uh, he's of school going age and I learned that he's in his high school, but he dropped out. He dropped out of school. That is because he's neglected. He's not having any, you know, attention. So what that brings to me is um, the fact that um, we are constrained in resources and, you know, expertise in all ways. But um, one thing I like to bring to all of our attention because I know we have CS, I mean a lot of stakeholders here. So that is um, to say, in as much as we would want to, okay, attention would be focused also on um, victims and uh, how victims recover. But I think it's also important that um, we look into some more into um, the effects of some of these um, happenings um, to 
I mean, the children of some of these people who actually are perpetrate, were perpetrators, but actually they're victims, all right? They might not be victims themselves, but their children are victims at this point. Because what happened is I learned this guy's not going to school. And um, something that broke my heart is that he wore the same um, attire for the whole day and for the night, in evening as well. And I, that got me thinking so much. And I learned he's not going to school. He's siblings are not going to school and that's really shocking for a person you know that i know has um his father had done a great deal for you know jame and jame's regime so you can see what um disappointment that person would be harboring so i think it's very important that our focus also goes into looking at how do we incorporate them into i mean this recovery process because they're also victims you know because the actions of their parents is coming back to haunt them they they, they were not responsible for what their parents have done you know in as much as you know however bad it was you know it wasn't their fault they didn't do anything you know but now they've been dropped out of school because their parents cannot pay them even though they were paying them with killer's money you know they were killing people and feeding their children but that is not the concern you know that is not the concern of the child what is his concern is he had to be educated and all that so i think that was an instant i saw this guy you know being neglected, losing all of that, some of which, you know, actually I'm finding my way through school, through university and all that, and, you know, on the contrary, he's not. So for me, it's more of um, how do we incorporate these people and how do we try as much not to marginalize them, and as much as that is not our goal, but, you know, looking at the dynamics, the what we are going through, I mean, even for us as victims who particularly, I would say, have the greater focus on, you know, as opposed to perpetrators, um, you know, trying to incorporate them. It is insufficient. The, I mean, the, how do you call it? The interventions are insufficient for even um, victims, you know, that you would say all of these things have been perpetrated. Talk less of um, children of perpetrators, you know, who are now facing, you know, justice for what they've done. But their children are not supposed to go through some of these things that they're going through. It's not, you know, they don't deserve these things. So for me, that's my point. I think every other thing has been captured, but uh, that's just something I like to reiterate, that we should find a way to bring them into. Thanks. That's a great point, Mohamed. You know, it's um, very important to bring that up. We try to get um, children of perpetrators as much as possible because, you know, it is part of um, the... Um, uh, uh, research. Our struggle was the fact that honestly they still see themselves as I'm not going to go there. How are they going to look at me? You know, um, uh, are they going to do this to try and revenge? Do you understand? So all these things are going on in their minds, which is basically affecting how people can access them. You know how they can seek help how they can receive help yeah, like it's like you say it's not their fault you know some people just knew about their parents um involvement in the former regime on tv you know um uh, so we have tried and we will continue to try to you know include them to basically provide them with um uh, psychosocial support as well as much as possible but it it, it means a lot that you as a direct and indirect victim as well you know yeah so that perspective you know it's not their fault i keep on saying it's not their fault whatever they did with um uh, the government don't bring them on us please something like that you know yeah thank you very much for bringing that aisha Transitional justice has not been working on since they started. Um, the fact that young people, victims, and a bit young victims are not being included, even for the fact that um, during the testimonies you could see families of victims that are young who had also been affected by the violations of their parents were never considered to come and talk about what really happened and then their own side of the story. And basically, not just about their story, but then the impact of the violations that their parent might go through so i think that is one thing um that i would like to commend you for um you you really take a bold step to make sure the voices of young victims are captured 
and uh, and attaining talking about the attainment of the never again talking about reconciliation talking about us reconciling as a country um, these the voices of youth are very important in, in attaining these reconciliation as a country so one good example would be if for instance now a young victim who is mainly an advocate for whatever violation happened to the parent and but maybe the extended family might not understand it that way and then a lot of us young maybe victims and that are key in the advocacy um the extended side of their family tend to see them as fighting your own and which sometimes is a bit difficult for you as a youth because your parent was killed as a victim your parent was killed and you you have the right to advocate for justice and all the necessary support for your for your direct family but sometimes the extended side of the family tend to see you're fighting your own for example they would say you cannot for example in some in some communities no matter what happened you cannot come out as a victim to, to to just say how you feel about these things so it's and it will take us ages to break those barriers because some victims still cannot go to um the communities that they came from for the fact that those communities see them as um they're fighting their own in a sense that they've been vocal about these things um Fony would be a very good example if you're from Fony and then you are being vocal you are being vocal talking about how difficult it is and how the violation how the impact of the violations that you've been through what would happen is she is or he is fighting his own people maybe there is a lack of understanding like they might not know what you've been through from the violation that had happened to you and your the, the violation that happened to your parents but they they seen it in a way that you belong to them but you cannot go against them and a lot of people are now coming out um from Fony that have been like the witch hunt victims that that live in Fony and other enforced disappearances um that happen in Fony then there are a lot of enforced disappearances that happen between the Fony but how many of how many of them are speaking out how many of their parents how many of their kids or their close family members are speaking about, about these violations if you come out and speak as a youth you've been seen as an outcast you don't belong to us because you cannot fight your own so this is something that this is a conversation that um i i would really want maybe fankanta to spare head because only conversations can make people realize that these victims this indirect victims or this youth that is being an advocate for his or her family is doing it because he or she feels that the impact of the violation is so difficult on her or her mom or her siblings so the only way that he he or she could just just come out to speak because that alone is fulfilling and that alone is you coming out to speak about what really happened to you so that is a conversation that would really be um should be um on top of our agenda as a country because if you talk about attaining reconciliation national healing for victims all of these comes comes back to the table we need to have this discussions but if we don't have this discussion it will take us ages for these vic young victims to to re to 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 um to unite again with their extended side of the family like the family that maybe their mom or their dad are from they can never go back there and they even if they have kids their kids would never relate to those people because they would say they would feel I'm an outcast I don't belong to this family I can't go there if I go there I'm like a threat to those families so this is just something that I like to share because it's affecting uh, maybe most of us as victims and it's affecting most of us maybe most of us as victims maybe it was not many but few of us are going through the same thing and uh and it's it's really difficult because we're going through it and then maybe we've been seen as fighting against our own but that's not the case but we're doing it because we want justice to be served and it's not about um maybe our parent who was a victim but it's about us fighting what is not 
what is not right. So basically, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anika. Thank you. That is um, uh, very important. Jackie, this is the point where our, um, our intent for psychoeducation should be looked into and uh, actually actioned you know, sooner than later. So it looks like um, what I can understand is we, that there is a greater really need to do intergenerational psychoeducation as well, or intergenerational dialogue, you know, to help people understand, you know, like we mentioned, the intergenerational trauma, you know, how it can affect young people, but how it is perceived by, you know, the older generation, how, you know, how do we bring everything to the drawing board and talk? You know, so, yes, Aisha, thank you very much. We will add that to the recommendation, but Fantanka will also, you know, in collaboration with CSBR, do something about that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but we have come to half past 12. Where is the food? What is it outside? <laughs> Are they passing? Yeah, no, no, we, yeah, yeah, we will do the photo. No, no, I'm not even said thank you yet. I'm just trying to get everybody. Yeah, um, uh, it is amazing to see this many people come to, you know, um, uh, validate this. Your feedbacks would be incorporated into the um, report before we launch it. I was hoping to hear from Binta Nyavali, Binta. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, if anybody is not comfortable talking out in the open, you have our numbers. Please call us and we will add whatever is um, necessary on the report because this is a national thing. We want to give this to the government. We want the National Youth Council to own this and to understand more of youth problems in the country. So it is not just Fantanka's problem. This is a national affair. You know, please, suggestion. Even the um, media team, don't leave it to us. <laughs> Disseminate the information. Let people understand the problems we are dealing with. And uh, the government, I just hope, um, pray that they are seeing this as supporting them and not, you know, anything against them. Because we don't want... The dictatorship come back to the Gambia. We want to leave a good ground for our children, their children as well. So let us all come together and make this happen. I thank you all very, very much, and I thank my team. Honestly, everyone has been uh, supportive. You know, I cannot start naming names, but you know. Yes, I mentioned Imran, so my, or else my thing is unfair. I would say, Jackie, Jackie, thank you very much. She is the consultant. Um, uh, we partner with CSVR, um, providing mental health and psychosocial support. You know, we have Papan sitting down there. He's done a lot of work with the beach youth, hence his rasters, huh? <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, we have Marlen, we have Yafat. Yafat was also with Fantanka. He has also, she has also done a lot with them. Um, um, Pichu, um, you know, Anja, Jamila, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, person.